this working? Oh, okay, we did it. I'm Thank so God. Glad. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Thank you. I well, wish we good. could get this over to my page too. Can you yeah. can we like record this video and save it? I think it'll record and go to my page. Others might have a better idea. Um, feel free to tweet and tell people you're on this page if you want. Um, yeah. Once it once it's recorded on my page, probably we can pull it over to yours too. Okay. Cool. We will figure it out. We will. Um, or maybe it goes, does it go on my page too? Because we're together? It would make sense. Oh, it's on both. They're saying it's on both. Okay. Yay. Okay. Yay. I, I, um, I was like, I bet there's a great blonde joke coming out of this, but. <laughs> I know the fact that we can't figure this out is like really bothering me. Um, so yeah, I wanted to do this because I'm so grateful for everyone that watched the Justice Project and Jessica has been a huge um, mentor for me and a huge role in that project that I did, but just in my journey of going to school again and learning so much about the system. So I think that it can be really scary during these times where people that are in prisons and in jails are experiencing what we're experiencing out here and dealing with COVID-19, but it must be just so scary for them that they're in these confined spaces. They probably don't have as much information about what's really going on. And then on top of that, they're getting all of their visits cut and that their loved ones can't really come to the facilities during this time because of coronavirus. So I just kind of wanted to you're my go-to person of who I call when I have questions and want to feel things out of like, what do you think is going on, you know, in the prisons right now? What do you um, anticipate to, can, to happen? So I wanted to share that experience with my viewers to basically be on one of our personal calls about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and going to my expert for the advice. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for, I mean, but... We appreciate all the work you do all the time, but especially right now during the coronavirus, because, you know, there's 2.2 million people who are living behind bars right now that are essentially sitting ducks for coronavirus. They are stuck in tiny cells. They don't have the hygiene items they need. Um, they can't get the soap, the hand sanitizer. I actually had a conversation with somebody in a facility the other day who said, you know, he's having to make the decision, should he buy soap or should he buy food? to eat uh, for while he's in there. And, you know, many of them can't get hand sanitizer because it has alcohol in it. It's a contraband item. Um, and then there's, you know, two or three people. Wow, I never thought there. about that. Yeah. I didn't even know that. And, and sometimes, you know, there's two, three, four people living in a cell that's like six feet by eight feet. You've seen the cells, Kim. I, you can't socially distance when you're living four people in a six by eight cell. So you know, people are, are terrified. They also don't have the protective gear they need. I, I got a message from somebody's daughter the other day saying her elderly father had had to fashion a mask out of his underwear, right? Like you think about the level of indignity that somebody is that desperate to protect their own life. Um, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And the people inside are scared. The, their loved ones are scared. And I was going to say, people that can't, uh, you know, come and visit, now they're getting that, like, love and communication cut off from them that they probably so enjoyed and needed for their soul. But now they probably can't even make these phone calls because they are so expensive. And, like, every outside communication is being cut off from them. So the loved ones must be really scared and frustrated also. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. I mean, I had a loved one who was in prison, and I was terrified every day that something was going to happen to him. But that's even before corona. You've also got people inside who, who are scared that something bad is happening to their family, and they can't afford to reach out, they don't have phone time to reach out and talk to them. So it's it's terrifying. We also know that the virus is actually spreading faster inside. 
if you look at Rikers and I Island. Think, but I think the notion is just that like, oh, it's safer because everyone is isolated. But what they're not really understanding is that, you know, like you said, they are in a cell with three people sometimes and you cannot social distance. You can't um, respect what they're asking everyone else to do outside because of their living situation. Or you've got people living in open bays where it might be 100 people, 300 people in one big room with triple bunks. Um, and then you've got people who are coming in and out of the facilities every day, the staff that works there that might be bringing it in or might be bringing it out to their families, to their communities. So it's, it's really a high risk that the prisons and jails could end up accelerating the virus if we don't take the right precautions to protect people inside. Yeah. I mean, it's just so crazy to think of like, for me, I feel like everyone is just now forgetting about people inside when there's a huge pandemic like this and everyone is just kind of fending for themselves on the outside when there's, so, like you said, 2.2 million people inside that need this protection. And it's so frustrating to see this happen and just to see that they're, they're not safe. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of stigma. I mean, this is what the Justice Project was about, right? Was telling the stories of people who are inside because we need more empathy. We need people uh, to realize that just because somebody made a bad decision and is doing time inside, it doesn't mean that they don't have value. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be redeemed. It doesn't mean that they should get a death sentence from this virus just sitting there. So what can people do? That's the one question that I get asked all the time. When they, the amount of phone calls I got after the Justice Project was like, okay, it's clear as day. I completely understand. You showed a whole different side to the justice system. Um, but what can I do? What can I do to help? So what would you recommend for people to do? And I always want to know that when people ask me, what, where can I direct them to go? I know you work with, you know, you're a co-founder of Cut50, Maybe you can explain to everyone what that organization is and um, what people can do to really help. Well, I think, so I threw in my bio, I threw a link to a petition uh, where you can sign our petitions to lawmakers. It also has a tool where you can call them directly. We've put together a, a safer plan. So their recommendations, Erin Haney, who you work with as well, jumped into action, worked with experts across the country put together the safer recommendations that will help jails and prisons stay COVID free, help protect people inside there. Now we need the lawmakers to adopt them and implement them. So I'd, I'd say go to my bio, go to the link in my bio, sign our petition, um, tell your lawmakers, you know, I care what's going on inside our prisons and jails. We don't want them turning into morgues. We want people in there to be safe. That's our communities are gonna be safe. Um, so get involved and, and help us get this implemented in all 50 states and in the federal government. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll post a link to that as well later so people can really understand how they can help. I mean, it's just crazy to think that, you know, Alice Johnson, if, you know, she wasn't out now, she would be uh, just sitting there probably so scared that she was going to get the coronavirus and, um, it's just such a scary thing to think about. And I, I really urge everyone to listen to what Jessica said and sign these petitions and that they help get all the laws passed and have all of the people that are, can make a difference really. Um, it, I think it really puts the pressure on to step up and pay attention, not to forget about the people that are sitting in our prisons and jails that are scared just like we are. Yeah. And Kim, you're I think shining it's to know that we're all going to get through this together, though. And it's about educating people to understand what they can do to really help. Yeah, and and you're a shining example of what happens when there's public pressure around the prisons and and jails, and how we can actually get people out because there are a lot of Miss Alice's. There are a lot of people in there who didn't even commit a crime. Uh, but are there because of a technical violation of probation or parole. So they missed a meeting with their probation or parole officer, or they didn't make a payment on time. Or there's a lot of people who are there because they just can't afford their bail amount. They haven't actually been convicted of a crime yet. So, you know, there's, there's people All that- All of those stories 
when you tell me them, just those hit so hard. Just thinking of, I always tell people, once you get involved and once you get started in trying to figure out how to fix such a broken system, you get so overwhelmed because there's so much that is broken. And when I hear about bail reform and just to hear that so many people spend so much time behind bars just because they can't afford their bail and how just unfair every single part of the system is. It really is overwhelming. And so that's why I want to do whatever I can to try to help that. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for using your voice to elevate this. Of course. Well, thank you for getting on the call with me. Um, are you doing okay? Kids you are know, okay? Kids are good. Uh, Hannah's studying from home. A little bummed that her sweet 16 got canceled, but obviously there's a lot worse stuff going on in the world, so she understands. You studying away? I am. I'm hiding in every corner that I can get to sneak away and study. I'm going to put you on a call with my kids later so you can tell them that, but it's very serious that mommy has to study and to give me the space to do that, please. Yes, I will. I'll tell her. I, I saw North earlier. North, mommy needs to keep studying. This the exam is coming up. She's quiet right now in my bathroom. So I'm going to let her be. And I can sit here and study afterwards and let her think that I'm still on our, our live chat. So she leaves me alone. <laughs> that works. That works. Well, thank you, Kim, for taking the time and, and hopping on the live. Sorry about the technical issues, but I appreciate it. Of course. You. Of course. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Talk to you soon. Go to Jessica's Bye. page. I'll post her link.